Las Vegas. It's more than just a city. It's a feeling. It's that feeling of excitement when you spot the lights of the strip out the airplane window. It's that feeling of awe as you stroll down the boulevard, taking in the sights and sounds. And it's that feeling of satisfaction knowing that you're in the greatest city in the world. Over 42 million people from around the world share that feeling every year. And I'm one of them. Taking you to the world-famous Vegas Strip and beyond, my name is Jeff, and this is Jeff Does Vegas. Hey there, and welcome to episode number 134 of Jeff Does Vegas. Before we get into this episode of the podcast, I just want to take a quick moment to thank my guest from the last episode of the show, Anne Martinez, who is currently starring as Sloan in the Las Vegas production of Jim Steinman's Bad Out of Hell, the musical, at the Paris Hotel and Casino. Ann and I chatted about what initially brought her to Las Vegas over a decade ago, some of her past Vegas performances, what it's like getting to belt out some of the greatest rock and roll songs of all time on a nightly basis, and much, much more. If you haven't had a chance to listen as of yet, jump into the archives at jeffdoesvegas.com or search out episode number 133, my special guest, Ann Martinez. It's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Okay, here we go. On to the show. When you get to Vegas and get yourself checked into your hotel room, what's the first thing you do? If you're like me, you probably get yourself settled in, freshen up, check out the view, maybe unpack your suitcase, and plan out the rest of your day. But have you ever given any thought on how you'd react if you needed to get out of the hotel immediately? The National Fire Protection Association has a whole list of safety tips on their website to ensure a safe escape from a hotel fire, including asking the front desk what the alarm sounds like, reviewing the escape plan posted in your room, and counting the doors between your room and the emergency exits. I'm guessing you've never done any of those things, but after this episode of the podcast, I'm thinking you just might start. On November 21st, 1980, the Las Vegas Strip was the site of what would become the third worst hotel fire in modern U.S. history and what remains as the worst disaster in the history of the state of Nevada. Early that morning, a small fire broke out in a restaurant at what was, at the time, the MGM Grand Hotel. The fire quickly spread, engulfing the casino level and sending thick black smoke and toxic fumes to the upper floors of the hotel. Dozens were killed, and hundreds more were injured. But what exactly caused the fire and led to such widespread fatalities and injuries? And what changes were made to ensure that something like this could never happen again? As we mark 42 years since this tragic event, these are the questions we aim to answer with this specially remastered version of Sin City Stories, Inferno at the MGM Grand. December 5th, 1973 marked the beginning of a new era in Las Vegas. Hollywood had come to town in the form of the MGM Grand Hotel, built by Kirk Kikorian, who at the time owned the iconic MGM Film Studios. The MGM Grand Hotel was the largest hotel in the world, built at a then staggering cost of $106 million, or roughly $600 million by today's standards. At opening, it had almost 2,200 guest rooms and suites, five restaurants, two showrooms, a movie theater for showing classic MGM films, and even an arena for live high lie games. Modeled after the 1932 MGM film Grand Hotel, starring Greta Garbo, John Barrymore, and Joan Crawford, Kikorian sought to bring a new level of elegance to the Vegas Strip, and that's exactly what he did. Adorned with high-end luxury touches like beautiful crystal chandeliers throughout the casino and massive portraits of MGM film stars on display, the resort also featured impeccably dressed bellmen and valets and doormen wearing gray waistcoats and top hats. Opening weekend at the MGM Grand Hotel looked like a Tinseltown red carpet gala with the likes of Cary Grant, Barbara Eden, Gregory Peck, and Shirley MacLaine in attendance as well as Rat Pack legend Dean Martin on hand to open the Celebrity Room showroom. 
Italian crooner Sergio Frankie was the first entertainer signed to star in the Celebrity Room when he landed a three-year contract in February of 1974. Frankie's frequent co-headliner was none other than comedian Joan Rivers. That showroom would go on to host almost every top name in entertainment and be the home of the long-running Dean Martin Celebrity Roast TV series. The MGM Grand Hotel was also home to the Ziegfeld Theater, which regularly featured productions from longtime Las Vegas choreographer Don Arden, who's credited with creating the famed Vegas showgirl image. Arden was the man behind incredible shows like Hallelujah for Hollywood, a massive celebration of the best that Hollywood had to offer, as well as the legendary Jubilee, which opened in July of 1981 at a cost of $10 million and went on to be the longest-running production show in Las Vegas when it eventually closed in February of 2016. And in 1985, the Ziegfeld Theater served as the filming location and host venue for Rocky IV's epic match between American hero Apollo Creed and Russian villain Ivan Drago. During the opening sequence featuring James Brown singing the hit song Living in America, dancers from Jubilee can be seen in their elaborate costumes performing on stage throughout Creed's ring entrance. With the MGM Grand Hotel, Kikorian matched and exceeded the opulence of Caesar's Palace and advanced the appeal of the Las Vegas Strip to both American and international tourists, as well as celebrities and high rollers looking to make Sin City their playground. But all of that glitz and glamour and luxury and fame meant absolutely nothing on a late November morning in 1980. Shortly after 7 a.m. on Friday, November 21st, 1980, a fire broke out in a restaurant known as The Deli on the main floor of the MGM Grand Hotel. The fire was discovered by hotel employee Tim Connor, who decided to take a shortcut through the then-closed restaurant. As Connor made his way through, he was horrified to discover a sheet of flames running from the top of a counter to the ceiling above. Connor managed to call security from a phone on the wall just before being knocked to the ground by a wave of heat and smoke. He scrambled along the floor and out of the deli, gathering other employees to help him grab fire extinguishers and hoses from inside the Barrymore restaurant next door. But by the time they made their way back to the source of the fire, it was far too late. The flames had reached the ceiling tiles, which had been attached with an incredibly flammable glue. As the fire began to spread rapidly above them and they realized they'd be trapped, Connor and the other responders fled back into the casino, closing the thick double doors behind them and shouting warnings to everyone. The closed doors managed to slow the fire for a few moments in the foyer between the restaurants and the casino, but the bot time came at a price. Time for a science moment. According to firefighters, when fire travels along a floor or furnishings, it will usually follow a predictable path from one item to the next, depending on the fuel available to consume. For example, a table next to a couch won't burn until most of the couch is on fire, but fire on a ceiling or upper wall burns more thinly and evenly across the surface, and usually the flames aren't large enough to reach the flammable material below. Instead, the room temperature rises steadily until what's known as flashover occurs. That's when all the combustible material in the room reaches its spontaneous ignition point at the same moment. The explosion from the flashover blasted off the doors to the casino entirely, which flooded the room with fresh oxygen for the fire to feed on. The resulting fireball, fueled by wallpaper, PVC piping, glue, and plastic mirrors on the walls, raced across the gaming area at an incredible rate of speed and blew out of the main entrance on the west side of the hotel towards the Las Vegas Strip. Luckily, Clark County Fire Department had a station located immediately across the street from the MGM Grand Hotel. The first truck arrived within two minutes of receiving the call from MGM security, and within less than an hour, crews had been able to fight the flames back to their source and had managed to get the fire fully under control. But the struggle that guests of the hotel were about to face was just beginning. 
many were sleeping soundly in the 2,000 plus rooms and suites above the casino and were completely and totally unaware of the chaos that was unfolding downstairs. But how could that be possible? First, there was no fire alarm to alert guests. The MGM Grand Hotel lacked automatic fire alarms. Staff had to manually activate alarms once a fire had been identified, and there were no manual alarm handles anywhere on the casino level of the hotel where the fire had started. Secondly, after the fire initially had been discovered, a PA system was used to alert people in the casino of the danger. But in the confusion, hotel guests in the towers were never notified. Guest rooms also lacked smoke detectors, meaning that many people in the MGM Grand Hotel had no idea there was a fire until they smelled smoke, heard people running and shouting in the hallways outside their rooms, or saw the fire trucks outside the building. As guests became aware of what was happening and attempted to escape, the danger became even more apparent. Thick black smoke and deadly toxic fumes created by the material that had burned in the casino downstairs had begun to fill the hallways in the hotel towers, making many of them impassable. Guests that did manage to get out of their rooms and make it to fire exits and stairwells discovered that they too were full of smoke. In addition, the doors to access the stairwells were set to automatically lock from the inside, meaning that once people were in the stairwell, they were trapped. And with smoke billowing up the stairwell like a chimney, the only direction to go was up forcing evacuees to make their way up as many as 20 flights of stairs towards what they hoped was the safety of the roof. For those guests that couldn't get out of their rooms or were forced back to their rooms by thick smoke, there were few options. Many used the furniture in their rooms to smash out windows in a desperate attempt to get fresh air. They filled their bathtubs and soaked towels to tuck around door frames to try to keep the smoke out of their rooms and they tied bed sheets together and hung them from balcony railings in an attempt to either escape to lower floors or alert firefighters of their presence. As guests stood on the balconies outside their rooms, clinging to each other for comfort, broken glass from the windows smashed out by guests rained down on the area below the resort towers, and a large mushroom-shaped cloud of black smoke rose over a thousand feet into the air above the hotel, which was visible for miles around the area. Guests on lower floors of the hotel were rescued by firefighters using ladders on trucks that were only able to reach as high as the ninth floor. Construction workers who were working on building an addition to the hotel used their scaffolding to try to reach windows that the fire truck's ladders couldn't get to. Elsewhere in the hotel, firefighters went floor by floor, banging on doors in an attempt to alert and clear guests from their rooms. In addition to those rescued by first responders, multiple helicopters, including those belonging to local police departments and Air Force units that were at nearby Nellis Air Force Base for a military exercise, helped to evacuate over 300 people from the roof of the resort. Some guests were assisted by bystanders. Two firefighters from Illinois who were on vacation in Las Vegas happened to be getting coffee near the deli when they heard the first shouts for help, and they remained in the building to assist in evacuating hotel guests. One security guard managed to drag two unconscious guests out of the hotel, and an advertising executive from Pittsburgh carried an elderly guest down 21 flights of stairs to safety. In the end, the process of getting everyone out of the MGM Grand Hotel took nearly four hours. Once that was complete, firefighters and first responders began the horrible task of going on the hunt for casualties of the fire. Victims of the blaze were found throughout the resort complex, in various stairwells, near the elevator bank on the main floor, in the casino area, and even inside elevators. The largest concentration of victims was on the upper floors of the hotel, between the 16th and 26th floors, with a majority being on the 20th and 23rd floors. In almost all of those cases, victims were discovered inside or near their rooms or in the lobby area outside the elevators. According to the coroner's report, a majority of fatalities were due to a combination of smoke inhalation and carbon monoxide poisoning, with very few deaths being linked to burns or other injuries. When all was said and done, 85 people were dead and over 650 people were injured. But what led to such widespread fatalities and injuries? And what caused this horrible catastrophe in the first place? 
those were questions that needed to be answered. The official cause of the fire at the MGM Grand Hotel was listed as an electrical ground fault inside a wall in the deli restaurant. A refrigerated pastry display case had been added to the deli after its initial construction. The case had a pair of copper lines that carried refrigerant from an evaporator unit in the display case to a condensing unit located outside the building, much like how an air conditioner functions. When it was installed, the copper lines were run through the same part of the wall as an existing electrical conduit and in contact with that conduit. The evaporator unit wasn't properly secured and as such vibrated constantly while in operation. The vibrations were carried along the copper lines, causing them to rub against the electrical conduit, which in turn also vibrated. Through a combination of corrosion and vibration of the lines, the plastic insulation on the electrical wires inside the conduit rubbed away in several spots. As a result, the conduit was no longer electrically grounded. The now bare wiring inside the ungrounded metal conduit glowed red hot and began to arc, which ignited the fire. According to reports, it was entirely possible that the fire had been smoldering inside the wall for hours before being discovered by employee Tim Connor at approximately 7 a.m. that morning. But how did what appears to be a simple electrical fire lead to the worst disaster in Nevada's history and the third worst hotel fire in modern U.S. history? To answer that question, we need to go back to the construction and design of the MGM Grand Hotel. The first issue was the sprinkler system, or lack thereof. Automatic sprinklers had been installed in limited sections of the property, including the arcade, the celebrity room showroom, convention areas, and the Barrymore Room restaurant. However, there were no sprinklers in the hotel tower, the 450,000 square foot casino, or most of the restaurant areas, including the deli where the fire started. At the time of the MGM Grand's construction in 1972, fire officials had been pushing for the installation of a full sprinkler system in the resort. However, Fred Benninger, MGM chairman at the time, deemed the $192,000 cost of installing the sprinkler system to be not feasible. So they went to the Clark County Building Department seeking an exception. It was agreed upon that MGM could be exempted from installing sprinklers in places that were occupied 24 hours a day. Reasoning being that employees would quickly notice a fire and could use an extinguisher to contain it. However, when the deli changed its hours and was no longer a 24-hour restaurant, sprinklers were never added. The other big issue was the ventilation system, which allowed smoke and toxic fumes to make their way from the casino into the hotel tower and into guest rooms. Commercial ventilation systems require what are called fire dampers, which are essentially trap doors inside ductwork held open by a small metal pin, which has a low melting point. The idea is that heat from a fire or smoke melts the pin, causing the trap door to slam shut. In the case of the MGM Grand, all of the fire dampers on the lower levels had been installed incorrectly, and the ones over the casino had been permanently bolted open by workers who clearly didn't understand the purpose of the dampers. As such, the pins melted, but the trap doors didn't shut. To make matters worse, once smoke had passed through all the ductwork, it entered what should have been an empty air circulation space above the casino called the plenum. But in the case of the MGM Grand, that space was filled with hundreds of miles worth of electrical wiring and drain pipes. The pipes were made out of ABS plastic rather than the traditional PVC. And although ABS was cheaper and easier to install, it had one major flaw. When burned, it created poisonous cyanide gas. The plastic insulation around the electrical wiring in the space also created its own toxic gas when melted. And further to this, seismic joints at the top of the plenum, intended to account for the expansion and contraction of the building during temperature changes or motion during an earthquake, were open to the ventilation system, which they shouldn't have been. 
As such, heated pressure from the fire in the casino sent smoke moving past the lower floors of the hotel to the top floors, where open air vents fed directly into hallways and rooms. Fans in the guest rooms, which were designed to be vented to an air shaft leading outside to bring in fresh air, were, for some reason, connected to interior air sources, meaning they were continuously pumping smoke and fumes directly into guest rooms. To complicate matters even more, the air conditioning units on the roof of the hotel hadn't been fitted with smoke detectors, meaning that they continued to circulate smoke and fumes back into the building. Other issues included flaws in the design of the elevators, where contrary to building codes, the elevator doors hadn't been tightly sealed on any level of the hotel, sometimes leaving gaps as large as a half to three quarters of an inch. This allowed smoke and toxic fumes to climb the shafts like a chimney and then creep out into the hallways of the hotel. Also, of the six stairwells intended to serve as emergency evacuation routes, the supposedly fire-rated materials used during construction failed in four of them. This allowed them to fill with thick smoke, which made its way into a hotel hallway every time a guest trying to escape opened an entry door. According to the final report from the National Fire Protection Association, these issues, along with many others, including a deficient number of fire exits from the casino, no way to manually activate the fire alarms in the casino area, no automatic means of shutting down elevators to prevent their use, and the fact that there was no evidence that the hotel staff had either attempted to execute an emergency plan or sound an evacuation signal, all led to the large loss of life and injury in this fire. Later newspaper articles revealed there were upwards of 83 different building code violations, design flaws, installation errors, and materials that contributed to the magnitude of this disaster. The big determination? If MGM had just gone ahead and spent the $192,000 on a sprinkler system, none of this would have happened. According to David Demers, who handled the investigation for the National Fire Protection Association, quote, with sprinklers, it would have been a one or two sprinkler fire and we never would have heard about it. Over 1,300 lawsuits were filed against 118 different companies involved with the MGM Grand Hotel. Money from the companies went into a $223 million settlement fund, which was distributed to the victims and their families within three years of the fire. MGM's $105 million settlement was the largest, and with that settlement, no negligence was ever admitted. Beyond the human toll of this disaster, it's hard to calculate the full economic impact of the MGM Grand Hotel fire. Over and above the $223 million in settlements paid out and the $300 million in reconstruction costs, there's the hundreds of millions of dollars lost in downtime at the MGM Grand, as well as the hundreds of millions of dollars in lost revenue from gaming and tourism throughout the Las Vegas area, as TV news showed the horrifying images of the fire for weeks and months afterwards. In all, potentially billions of dollars literally went up in smoke as a direct result of the decision to save $192,000 by not installing sprinkler protection. After the MGM fire, safety officials in Clark County prepared recommendations for updating the fire code that would have led to Nevada having the most rigorous standards in the United States. But when their proposal was submitted to legislators in the state capitol, the regulations failed to gain any traction. Many state officials believed the fire at the MGM Grand was a one-off rare occurrence, and the odds of it happening again were astronomically small. Plus, money talks. Developers, who make massive campaign contributions, lobbied hard against regulations that they believed would slow down their business and eat into their profits. All of that opposition went away less than three months later. February 10th, 1981. A massive fire, this time sparked by arson, not accident, broke out on the eighth floor of the east wing of the Las Vegas Hilton. Within minutes, flames had burst out of a window in the elevator lobby and were climbing 22 floors up the outside of the building, while the inside of the hotel was filling up with thick black smoke and toxic fumes. Firefighters, using what they'd learned from the MGM fire, used local TV news, the Hilton's closed-circuit TV channel, and a PA system to inform guests to stay out of hallways and stairwells and remain in their rooms to wait for help. 
By the time the Hilton fire had been completely extinguished, eight guests had been killed and over 400 others had suffered injuries, largely from smoke inhalation. The sight of the Las Vegas Hilton being transformed into a towering inferno so soon after the MGM fire reinforced panic among local officials that Las Vegas was developing a reputation for its lack of fire safety, which could ultimately hurt tourism, thus killing the economy. In the months following the MGM Grand and Hilton fires, the state of Nevada enacted the toughest fire code and inspection protocols in the country. Some of these measures included automatic sprinklers in every high-rise taller than 55 feet and every large public area, with no grandfathered exceptions. Pressurized elevator shafts and stairwells to give people a clear escape route and avoid the chimney-like effect that sucked smoke to the upper levels of the MGM Grand. Automatic elevator recalls that send elevators to specific floors and remove them from service during a fire. Ventilation and air conditioning system shutoffs. Extensive fire alarm systems in high-rise buildings, including a voice communication system, and evacuation plans posted on the back of every hotel room door. Code changes also focused on locked doors and stairwells. In the MGM Grand, the doors providing access to the stairs were designed to lock behind guests as an added measure of security to keep unauthorized guests from entering the floor. But during the fire, people entered the stairwell expecting to escape to safety, only to find it full of smoke and now trapped with a locked door behind them. The new codes required that doors automatically unlock when a fire alarm is activated to allow for a safe exit in case of danger. Since the fire at the MGM Grand, there have been other hotel fires in Las Vegas. February of 2003, a lit cigarette in a laundry chute caused the evacuation of two floors of the Aladdin Hotel and Casino. In July 2015, fire broke out on the 14th floor pool deck of the Cosmopolitan Hotel, sending thick black smoke high above the strip. And in April of 2017, a faulty light fixture caused a portion of the roof over the retail area at the Bellagio to catch fire. But on January 25th, 2008, memories of the MGM Grand Hotel fire were reignited. At around 11 a.m. that morning, welders working on the roof of the Monte Carlo sparked a massive fire that spread to the outside of the building. Once the decorative foam facade attached to the hotel caught fire, the flames spread quickly down the side, eventually covering the top four floors. With this fire, there was a huge potential for disaster. But thanks to safety measures and fire codes put in place some 28 years prior, there were no fatalities. Sprinklers and alarms in the Monte Carlo activated as they should have. Hotel staff made their way through the hotel room by room to make sure people were out. And loudspeakers gave people clear and specific directions on how to safely escape. Unlike the MGM Grand Fire, some 5,000 guests and 1,000 employees at the Monte Carlo were safely evacuated from the hotel. 17 people were treated for smoke inhalation, but otherwise, there were no serious injuries or deaths. If there's a silver lining that can be taken from the MGM Grand Hotel fire, it's that since the improvements made to the fire codes following that disaster, there hasn't been a single fire-related fatality at any Las Vegas Strip resort. If you want to learn more about the history of the original MGM Grand Hotel, the fire that claimed the lives of 85 innocent victims, and the other incidents covered in this episode of the podcast, check the show notes for links to Volume 2 of Sin City Stories at SinCityStoriesPod.com, where you'll find articles, photos, videos, and much more. And that wraps up another episode of Jeff Does Vegas. If you've got feedback on this episode of the show, or any other episode for that matter, or you've got suggestions and ideas for topics you'd like me to cover on the podcast, please feel free to reach out to me via Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Jeff Does Vegas. Or drop me an email directly at Jeff at JeffDoesVegas.com. In the meantime, thank you so much for checking out the show. Be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll know the moment new episodes are available. 
And don't forget to visit JeffDoesVegas.com for past episodes and show notes. My name is Jeff, and this has been Jeff Does Vegas, a Walker New Media production.